Greetings and welcome to Ever Present. I'm Pastor Michael Mira, and these are my friends. I'm Savannah James. I'm John Spellman. Have you ever tried to hide from God? That's what we've been speaking about in the last two episodes. We've been speaking about the story of Jonah and what the story of Jonah has to tell us about hiding from God. We learned that Jonah did not appreciate the mission that God had planned for him. He didn't want to go and preach to the Ninevites, even if he was issuing them a warning of the judgment that was about to come upon them. He still didn't want to do it because he understood that God was merci merciful and he understood that the Ninevites could possibly benefit from a ministry that he was going to share with them. And he, he couldn't stand that thought. Uh, sometimes you may feel that God is impressing upon you something or calling you to go in a certain direction that you don't want to go. God wants something for your life. He may want you to make certain changes and you kind of block those ideas out of your mind. We also spoke about how some people want to block out the idea that there is a God from their mind. And there are different ways of doing that. We hide from God in different ways. Sometimes people hide from God through addictions. Addictions could be drugs, it could be alcohol, but an addiction can also be too much TV or spending money. There are many kinds of addictions that people suffer from. Sometimes the addiction is acceptable to society and not considered an addiction. And so as long as everything is okay with you and those around you, you might not realize you have an addiction. But the truth is, if God is not in your heart, then there's going to be something missing and you're going to seek to fill that space with something else. You see, God is the one that holds everything together the right way. And we were designed for a relationship with him. And the Bible says God is love. And so in order to truly know how to love, we have to know God. But without that healthy relationship with God, if you're running away from God or you're running away from something that God is calling you to do, you will try to fill that void. You will try to do things your own way. And oftentimes, or every time, the result is some kind of addiction, some kind of addiction, some way of trying to do things on your own, some way of trying to escape God. When somebody suffers from an addiction of one kind or another, an, addict, an addictive behavior is a behavior really that results from having a need, having a need that you're trying to fulfill, but you're not trying to fulfill it the right way. You're trying to fulfill it the wrong way. And ultimately, as human beings, we try to solve our problems and take care of our needs without God, without God. But addictions are also dangerous. And so whatever the addiction is that a person may have, whether it is shopping, whether it is too much TV, whether it is being addicted to what other people think about you, whether, whether it is possessions or whether it is other kinds of more apparently dangerous behavior like drug use or alcohol, or even promiscuity or other behaviors that can end up uh, bringing about very destructive results to the person, whatever it is, one way or another, if you don't have God, you have some kind of an addiction. Because God is love, and if we're not experiencing that healthy relationship with God, something is going to be off about the way we love. And something is also going to be off about the way we experience happiness. When we think about addictions, addictions addictive behavior oftentimes starts out with a, a desire to achieve happiness somehow. To somehow bring about happiness in your own life through a behavior that ultimately is dangerous and poisonous. But true joy and true peace can only come from God because we were designed to have a relationship with him. 
And so when we look at those fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, and we see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, those fruit of the Spirit, that can only come from having the right relationship with God. But without God, we're truly not going to have joy. We're not going to have true peace. And so we may experience moments of joy. We may experience fleeting moment, moments of happiness. But the lasting and true happiness only comes from God. And so we try to bring ourselves happiness with other things. And so in the end, that's what I mean when I speak about addiction and saying that if you don't have the right relationship with God, there is going to be some kind of addictive behavior that you have. But people also run away from God just simply by doing things they want to do without any consideration of God, living lives they want to live. Your life may, may appear to be a success to everybody around you. But ultimately, in God's perspective, which is the only perspective that matters, because he designed you and he loves you more than you even love yourself. And he knows you more than you know yourself. And his plan is the ultimate plan for your life. But when you decide to do things your way, you may be successful. You may even become rich. It may be possible for a person to become rich and wealthy, living a life that is totally not the life that God has for them. But that's another way of running from God, and it does connect, again, to that idea of addictive behavior, trying to give yourself happiness and trying to fulfill yourself, to fulfill yourself without God. See, only God can fulfill us and truly fulfill our needs. And sometimes people hide from God from blocking him out of their thoughts, blocking the ideas that he may be bringing to your mind out of your mind. So there are different ways that we try and hide and run from God. And these are things that we spoke about in the past, Today we're going to continue to speak about Jonah, and uh, this time we're going to end up talking a little bit about who Jonah is, his name, what his name means, what, it, what the context of Jonah's story has to do with hiding from God, and we're going to focus on chapter 2 of Jonah. We left off on chapter 1, we went through chapter 1, now we're going to speak about chapter 2. Let us ha open with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being with us today. We thank you for the, the love that you are able to pour into our lives and to bring us true fulfillment and true joy if we surrender unto you. It may be hard for some of us to realize that we can truly be happy living the way that you have called us to live rather than just doing the things we want to do it may also be difficult for some of us to realize that we can actually enjoy doing things your way and keeping your law rather than doing things our way. Oftentimes we cannot perceive how we can enjoy living a life in service and dedication to you because we have a sinful and self-centered nature and we don't realize that we were designed by you and designed with a purpose and only if we are living in accordance with the purpose that we were designed for can we experience true love and true peace. And so God you designed us for a purpose but oftentimes we we are running away from it. But we can never truly hide from you because you are ever present. We thank you for being ever present and Lord we want to just say a special word for anyone who is listening into the program who may be hiding from you in some way, may be hiding from the thought of you, or may be hiding from something that you are calling them to do. We want to say a special word of encouragement to them today, and we want to be able, Lord, to minister to their needs with this special ministry at Ever Present. And so we pray, Lord, that we do your will in our ministry. We don't want to run away from our ministry, but we want to receive and be blessed by the ministry that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for using us here at Ever Present to minister to those outside of this church building. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, hold on just one second. All right. All right, so for those of you guys who are listening in, conference muted. if you are calling in by phone and you want to participate, just hit five star on your telephone keypad, which will send us a signal right here in the studio that you are ready to make a comment or ask a question. Uh, if you are calling in by webcam, just hold up one finger into the air, 
and then we'll put you on screen with us so that we can talk uh, face to face. So this way we don't have everybody kind of like talking over each other. So whenever you guys want to uh, make a comment or ask a question, just hit five star, and of course we'll uh, we'll acknowledge your comment and uh, and put you on the air with us. So uh, we invite you to. Uh, stop us at any time and ask your questions and make your comments because your participation makes our show. And if you're not um, using a web camera or you're not on by phone, feel free to send it in the text chat. That's great, too. All right? So, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Very good. And uh, we hope you can uh, join us today and give us your questions and interact with us. It would be a great blessing for us as well. So we were talking about hiding from God. You know, uh, Jonah didn't like the mission that God had planned for him. God had a very special mission. and God loved Jonah, but God also loved Jonah's enemies. And uh, the Bible is clear that we have to love our enemies as well. Now, loving your enemy doesn't necessarily mean that you try and, and conjure up uh, some gushy emotional feeling for people that are really giving you a hard time. That's not what it means. But it means you have to do what is right toward everyone, including your enemy. And there is the concept of tough love. Sometimes we have to take certain stands toward people that may be injuring or hurting us. And in Jonah's mission to the Ninevites, he wasn't just coming there with flowers. I mean, he was telling them, look, there's, there's a, a judgment about to come. This was tough love, but it also offered an opportunity to the Ninevites. It also offered an opportunity. And Jonah seemed to understand that. You know, and so Jonah didn't appreciate this 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 mission that God had uh, that God had given him, and so he tried to hide from God. And in the past, we talked about Psalm one thirty nine. You can't hide from God; He's ever present. He's everywhere. He knows. And so we spoke about the fact that God brought a storm. God brought a storm to shake Jonah up. This is what we talked about in the last episode. God, God sometimes has to shake things up. We're trying to hide from him. We're trying to do things our way. And sometimes God has to shake things up in our life. We'll talk a little bit more about, a little bit more about that today. Yeah, and we also learned last week uh, that we did this, that even though uh, Jonah had chosen to go on the wrong path, God used his detour in order to reach people whom he never would have or should have come in contact with. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in spite of the fact that Jonah made this mistake, uh, God used that same mistake, not that God purposed that this would happen, but God used that mistake in order right. to reach those whom, whom Jonah came in contact with. But now, okay, the sailors who were with Jonah originally came to know God. They were offering up sacrifices to God. They now b were believers. They went from pagans to believers in the, in the only true God. Yeah. But now God is still back to the initial problem of Jonah and his unwillingness to go to Nineveh. Right. So right. it's like, okay, God may use the situations in your life when you choose to rebel and you say, I'm not doing it God's way. God may still use the situations in your life to accomplish great things. Mm -hmm. But then even in accomplishing great things, he's not going to just say, okay, well, I lost Jonah, but at least I got these guys. Mm -hmm. God's going to shake things up in your life as well because he's still just as concerned with you. So Jonah wasn't just a tool or just an instrument that God didn't care about, right. that, that God was just using to reach people mm -hmm. and God didn't care about Jonah. Right. Rather, God not only used Jonah to reach people in his disobedience right. and in his detour, but now he's also going to take the time to get through to Jonah himself because God cares about the salvation of others, yes. and he also cares about the, uh, the, the salvation of his servant. Right, right. Amen. So, Vanya, did you want to share anything? I was thinking about the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes people say stuff about you, and then you find, like, there's a problem um, I was wondering if um, you should like purposely, you know this person hurt you, right? Mm -hmm. And um, should you purposely like stop talking to them, but say, can you really forgive this person and then stop talking to them? Or can mm -hmm. you, do you supposed to still like, I don't know, talk to them and treat them the way that a Christian should? I'm not like really. Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Um, <laughs> I'm like kind of. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, somebody really hurts you. Yeah. Are you yeah. supposed to, like, cut that friendship off totally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how can you heal with that situation? Like, yeah. Like, how can you heal with that? That's a good question, and every situation is different. The thing is that we have to build our decision on godly principles. So what, what Savannah is asking is a very good question. You know, sometimes somebody has taken advantage of us, Something somebody has done something, somebody has done something wrong to us, 
and we, you know, maybe somebody stole something from you, for example. Uh, you, you ask them to house it, and then they stole things from you. Do you then ask them to house it again? No. If there is no, uh, you know, y you don't, if loving someone and forgiving someone doesn't mean that we should be careless or that we should be a doormat. So every situation is different. And we have to be very prayerful about we handle it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not one answer right. for every situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if John wanted to add something to yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are certain times like when uh, you forgive a person. Like, let's 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 be real here. You know, if we yeah. if we say that we forgive a person, but we still harbor anger or animosity in our hearts, and the question becomes, have we really forgiven that mm -hmm. person? Uh, you know, it, it could be something as simple as a person stepped on your shoe. You say you forgive them, but in, in the reality, you're thinking negative thoughts about them. You know, you're, you're, you're planning violence in your head against them, which you wouldn't act out, but you're still right, thinking it. Right. So in, that, in those cases, we're not really uh, forgiving. But at the same time, um, there has to be at times consequences mm -hmm. for when someone commits a certain type of crime. So, for example, I'm going as far as thinking about... Um, people who hurt children, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, in those cases, okay, yeah, you can be forgiven in, in terms of being relinquished from the, uh, the anger that the person might feel toward you, but then there still has to be consequences. You can no longer be trusted around children right, when right. you've made that kind of mistake. And it's not really just for their protection. It's also for your protection. Right. Uh, so, you know, you might not be trusted, but then that's, that's, that's a, a natural consequence of what we've done. Right. So, um, there are times when the consequences are still binding, even though you've been forgiven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then there are times when uh, the consequences are not binding. Right. You know? So I think that uh, maybe if the person's stolen $1,000 from you, you don't trust them with more money, per se. Right. But that doesn't mean that the relationship can't continue. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, that each, like you said, each scenario is very different, you know, in order to, to say specifically what you should do in each, in each case and then how you, exactly you should forgive. I think the goal of forgiveness is to restore the relationship right. um, and not to harbor anger toward the other person, but to, but to still uh, remain in connection with each other. Right. Not to hold on to the anger. Right. Yeah. And, and it reminds me of uh, Moses in the Bible. Uh, the point came when God told Moses to talk to the rock and instead he struck the rock. Yeah. And God, mm -hmm. God forgave Moses. Moses uh, was not going to experience eternal damnation. Mm -hmm according to scripture, but Moses never entered into the promised right. land. Mm -hmm. He never entered it, and that was a consequence. Or David, for that matter. David was certainly a person who we're going to see saved in the kingdom, mm -hmm. but you know, when it came to his sin with Bathsheba, his first child with her had to die. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. God said that the sword would never depart from his household because he did this thing. God forgave him, but the consequences were still in place. Right. And this isn't like um, uh, punitive consequences. Mm -hmm. These are consequences that were necessary uh, because of you know, the crime that had been committed. Right. You're right. So uh, we, we do see that um, Jonah was now going to, being called to minister to an enemy, to an enemy. And, and, and if we study about the ancient Assyria, they had done terrible things to their enemies. Uh, they would torture their enemies. They would maim their enemies. They were, they were people that were, that were really to be feared. Mm -hmm. And they were no friend of the Israelites, and now Jonah is being called to minister to them. And you may be being called to minister to somebody that you might think, I don't want to do this, I better not do it. But maybe God is calling you. Or it may be something else. Maybe God is calling you to cut certain things out of your life. We spoke about in the past when we talked about uh, Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 9, 43. We spoke about that, those very difficult lessons, almost sounding violent. Uh, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's not literal, but it is, a, in, in one sense, a, a radical act that a person takes. And it may even be, you may even describe it as a violent act, mm -hmm. in a sense. For example, if you've had friends that were always involving you in dangerous behavior... And now you've got to cut off those friendships because there's no way you could be their friend. That, that can be considered a violent act for the sake of the kingdom, you see. And so God is calling us to, to take certain steps that may be necessary. And, and, uh, and so we might not want to take those steps or we might not want to engage in certain, in, in the calling that God is, is, is giving us. And, and so when we look at Jonah, we see somebody 
we see somebody who really is an object lesson to us mm -hmm. about the idea of what do I do? How, what happens when I try to run away from what God is calling me to do? And of course we see that uh, when he was thrown overboard, yeah. uh, you know, he's um, uh, basically gobbled up by this uh, sea creature. Yeah. Uh, we don't know exactly what kind of fish it is, but we know that yeah. God prepared a great fish uh, and swallowed Jonah. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's actually been, I think, three recorded instances in which a whale um, wow. has swallowed a human being, and the human being survived and was spit out. Um, you know, so there. So we don't know, of course, if the, if the great fish that, that swallowed up Jonah was a whale, right. but it does promote a. Uh, it could have been, but you know, it does promote a sense of um, uh, of, uh, of faith in the story of Jonah because we know of three instances relatively recently where such a thing has happened. Right. 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 And, um, you know, we, we are not delving into the, the, the Hebrew or what, the scientific classification, but we, we, you know, it may be possible that this was a whale. We mm. don't, we're not, we don't know. Or was it, a, was it some other kind of creature? We don't know. Or was it a, a, a strange, uh, I've even heard a theory once that maybe it was some very, uh, you know, it was a creature that God had prepared in a unique way just for that moment. We don't know. Maybe a mutant kind of a yeah. fish of some kind, a, a fish that had a certain, you know, maybe its body was mutated in a certain way that it could actually house Jonah. But we don't know. Uh, that's the point. We don't really know. The point is that whatever this creature was, wh whether it was a whale or whether it was a, a whale shark or of some sort or whatever it was, or maybe a creature that isn't, uh, it has gone extinct. The fact is that God sent this creature and... Um, he had prepared it. The, the word is very clear in verse 17. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. So how was that fish prepared? We don't know. And another thing that's interesting about it, too, is that, um, you know, technically, if you're inside of a fish's belly, then you're going to be digested. Yeah. But Jonah wasn't just uh, swallowed by the fish, but he was uh, basically preserved within the fish yes so i think that's that's an important point that we can't miss because uh, you know normally when a fish begins to swallow you and take you in you know it could be chewing on you it could be uh you know letting loose those, those digestive solutions on you right. and you're pretty much done for especially if you're in there for longer than a day yeah right but that's not what's happening to jonah jonah doesn't prepare the fish in order to because like when we left it off last week it would seem like wow you know it seems a bit harsh that that god would send a fish to swallow jonah and now he's done for mm -hmm. the, the 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 purpose of the fish was not to end jonah the, the purpose of, of the fish is more like giving birth to a new jonah hmm. so it's kind of like the fish takes him in and swallows right. him in and takes him down to the watery grave but when he when the fish at the end spits him out he then is uh giving birth to a new jonah a new man that's, right. a new man that's, that's going to go out and, and follow what god original what God's original plan was right and it's kind of like what has to happen to us sometimes God has to allow life to take us in and swallow us up mm. and bring us to our lowest point just like Jonah was brought deep beneath the sea deep beneath the earth mm -hmm. and then sometimes when God is ready to spit us back out and to bring us out from whatever it is that has swallowed us whole mm -hmm. then uh, we become like a new person that's right. ready to face the challenges and ready to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in us that's right that's right so, so, this, so we, we look at Jonah. Now, it's interesting to note that the name Jonah, the name Jonah means a dove. Isn't it interesting? We think of a dove. And you can think of a dove in two different ways. Let's take a look, for example. Well, most of the time when we think of dove, what do you think of? So, Vanna, when you say dove. Okay. Like, gentle, meek. Kind yeah. Of bird. And, and when you think of a dove, in connection with the Bible, mm -hmm. what do you think of? Jesus, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yeah. right? Yeah, so peace. most people, peace, right? Yeah. But then, there's another passage. Let's look at Hosea. Hosea 7 and verse 11. Hosea 7 and verse 11. Okay, okay and you can uh, read that one. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they say, uh, they go to Assyria. Okay, okay. So here we see an interesting passage about a silly dove, a silly dove. And this dove is, um, is going to Egypt. Now, the, it's talking about Ephraim, Ephraim. Now, Ephraim was a way of referring to Israel, 
Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, which was the kingdom that was the context of Jonah's ministry, the northern kingdom. And he was serving, as I mentioned in the past, during the time, the prosperous reign of Jeroboam II, according to 2 Kings 14.25. So the northern kingdom, and the Bible referred to the northern kingdom as Ephraim, but the northern kingdom was appealing to these, uh, these basically these mighty empires that were enemies, that were enemies of Israel in the context of what was just read in Hosea chapter 7 and verse 11. And so we see here a, a silly dove, a silly dove. Now, when we think of the dove, uh, we, we usually don't think of the silly dove. We don't think of a silly dove in that sense. But here we see a silly dove. But then we also, as Silvana mentioned, and we think of peace, right? We think of, uh, for example, uh, Matthew 3.16, when Jesus was baptized. And what happened when Jesus was baptized? Uh, John, what The happened? Holy Spirit descended in bodily shape like a dove yeah. and, uh, you know, lighted upon him. Right, and we also see that, again, in the parallel in Luke, for example, in Luke 3.22. But we, we were also reminded of the dove with the olive branch mm -hmm. in, in the book of Genesis. Yeah. So in Genesis chapter 7 and verses 8 through 12, we read about what happened there. When Noah... Noah sent out, out the, uh, the dove. Yeah. yeah, he sent out the dove. And that dove with the olive branch in its mouth, that, that's a very um, you know, famous mm -hmm. symbol yeah. for a lot of people. It symbolizes peace. And mm -hmm. you think, oh, okay... You know, and we even talk about that, right? Don't we say, I'm going to extend to you an olive branch mm -hmm. when right. two people are yeah. having a conflict with one another or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we sometimes use that language, I'm going to send out to you an olive branch. So, so in a sense, we see these two images. We see these two images of, of, a, of a, a dove in the Bible. One being a silly dove, a, 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 um, a dove that doesn't realize that that he's flying into his own his own doom mm -hmm. or his own death and then we see a, another dove which symbolizes peace and so jonah jonah ironically was being called by god to deliver a message to the ninevites that would ultimately bring them peace mm -hmm. even though the message was about judgment <laughs> even though the message was yeah. about judgment right I think of new life too with the dove with the olive branch mm -hmm. because after the flood right. we waited for new life to come back on on the earth and the dove gave bring the flower the mm -hmm. twig to symbolize new life. Yes. So there's life again. Very good point. Very yeah. good point. So and in that sense God was calling Jonah also to the Ninevites to to offer them a chance at a new life. Um if they would receive the word, if they would heed the warning then they would be converted and they would live a new life. And so Jonah, in a sense, Jonah, in a sense, is uh, faced with an option. You, am I going to be a silly dove? Am I going to fly to my own destruction? Kind of like the passage we were reading in, in chapter 7 of Hosea, verse 11. Or am I going to bring, am I going to do God's will? And I'm, am I going to bring peace? Am I going to be an instrument of God to bring peace, ultimately? And so that's kind of what uh, Jonah was facing. Now, it's interesting when we think of Israel, uh, when we think of ancient Israel, because Israel was really uh, on the highway, on the highway between Egypt and Assyria. So in a sense, when we look at that passage in Hosea, we consider that context of Israel reaching out to these enemy empires for help according to the Adventist Bible commentary about those passages Israel was in a sense wetting the appetite hmm. of those en enemies who wanted control of that territory they wanted to gain access to that highway between them which was where Israel was situated and so uh, they appealed to one they, they appealed to Egypt hmm. and uh, then they appealed to uh, the other one Assyria which ultimately ended up taking over and, and conquering Israel in 722 B.C. And Jonah's ministry was before that. So Jonah was, in a sense, he was, 
he was kind of in a position where am I going to seek the help from my enemies or am I going to help my enemies? Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at Israel, Israel was seeking the help from its enemies. Israel was seeking help from its enemies. Jonah now is being called to help his enemies. And so it's a very ironic thing. You know, uh, Jonah wasn't really seeking the help of Assyria, but he did want to get away from them. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, he, when he went on that boat, um, you know, it may be a stretch here to say this, but just to connect it with the passage in Hosea 7.11 of Israel seeking the help of its enemies, Jonah was in a sense seeking the help of these pagans, right? These, these, were non, uh, these were not people who knew about the God of Israel, and he was ultimately going to them in order to get away. So in, in a sense, we can kind of think about them as instruments that would aid Jonah in running away from God. And, and though they didn't know what they were doing in any conscious sense, I'm only speaking uh, uh, in, a, in a practical sense, Anybody who is aiding you, anybody who is helping you to get away from God is not your friend. Mm. You might have somebody who tells you everything you want to hear. They're not helping you. And isn't that sad that mm -hmm. many times that's what we consider our friends, people yeah. who tell us what we want to hear. Yeah, and you know, it, when you say that they're not our friends, I mean, we may have good relationships with people, yeah. but they're not leading us down the right path, and that's that's kind of the problem, you know? Right. Uh, and Jonah, in a sense, is like a silly dove who, you know, is getting is, is about to be swallowed up by this great big fish, yeah. and he's putting his trust in these individuals who are going to lead him down the path to being silly. Right. Right? And we, sometimes when we're running away from God, we make friends with people uh, who will cause us, and who we also cause, to be silly, in a mm -hmm. way, you know? So when we're talking about this concept of silliness, we're talking about, you know, friends that are going to take us away from, uh, you know, the church or from the Bible and get us involved in the nightlife. Friends that are going to take us away from what we know and maybe the, 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 will replace uh, ministry with sports or something like that. You know, they're, they're taking us away from what's right and taking us down the path to what is wrong. And because they're doing so ignorantly, you know, they don't know that in, in many cases that they're leading us down the wrong path. Right. But then, nonetheless, we're still going down the wrong path. And instead of us having an influence over our friends to bring them down the right path, we're allowing them to influence us to bring us down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. right. And in that sense, we're like a silly dove. And Jonah went into the, into the belly of the fish, a silly dove, but the fish spits him out, an right. intelligent dove. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, and, and again, when, I, when I'm talking about friends in connection with Jonah going to these, to these sailors and trying to get away... Um, and John is right in pointing that out. I'm only speaking objectively and practically. I'm not speaking in terms of your feelings. You may, you may have, uh, you know, affectionate uh, uh, feelings towards someone. And I'm not speaking in that sense. You know, you might like people that really are not drawing you closer to God. That you might have a good relationship with them. I'm not, on, I'm not speaking in terms of feelings. I'm only speaking in terms of practical and objective results which we see with the story of Jonah and you can also measure those practical and objective results in your own life with people that you know is this person drawing you further away from God is this person helping you get closer to God mm -hmm. um, you may love the person you know the Bible says we have to love our enemies too as we mentioned before yeah. so it's not a question of loving and hating but only looking at what direction? Sense. Yeah, what yeah, direction? How are you being? How are you being aided by this mm -hmm. situation? And, you know, I think in a practical sense that a lot of times it is uh, our friends and the people whom we have relationships with that make it easier for us to hide from God because if yeah. they don't know God, then they're not concerned with their you know eternal consequences for things that they do, and so you know they're living life uh, without that knowledge. And yeah. uh, when you're hanging out with them, it allows you to live life without that knowledge, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, through their influence. Uh, and these are people who probably cared about Jonah. I mean, we see that when God first, uh, when he gets on board the ship and, and the storm is first sent and, and Jonah says, what, what shall, uh, sorry, the, the captain, I think it, it was, that asked yes, Jonah, yes. what should be done to you mm -hmm. to stop this storm? Mm -hmm. Jonah says immediately, throw me overboard. Right. And they actually tried not to overthrow yeah. him. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to do it. Right, right. So in that, in that sense, they were good friends, mm -hmm. but yet they were, uh, the way I like to think of it is good friends 
negative influence. Right. Mm. right. And so you can have good friends in your life mm-hmm. that just have a negative influence on you because they don't know any better. Right. And that's exactly what Jonah was going through here. Mm-hmm. But see, there comes a point at which God has to separate you from people who are otherwise good friends, who are well-intentioned, who are in, in general good people, mm-hmm. but because of their negative influence, God has to separate from you from them and get some time alone with you to redirect your path so that you can have a positive influence on those who, whom you come in contact with. You see, rather than Jonah uh, being a positive witness mm-hmm. for God with these friends of his, mm-hmm. he was a negative influence because he's telling, he gets on board the ship and he tells them that he's running from God because yeah. he doesn't want to do what God is. What message does that send mm. to people who don't know God? Right. Mm-hmm. And when we think about us in that same situation, how are some of the things that we do a negative influence on our friends who don't know God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they're already ignorant of, of, of the existence of God and, and that there's only one true God. And so now through our actions, we're making it even worse. Right. Mm-hmm. So originally these friends try to rescue Jonah. They don't want him to throw him overboard. They're trying to, to, to throw Everything the water out. Else. They're yes. throwing the, 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 the material food. things that they brought on board yeah. overboard. Yeah, they would have had to throw out the food. They're throwing everything else overboard. Mm-hmm. But when it came down to it, Jonah had to go. Yep. And so this wasn't to bring about Jonah's demise, like I was saying before, but it was so that God could bring Jonah to a place mm-hmm. where he could really reason with him and where, and where Jonah would listen. There are times when our friends and the people closest to us prevent us from being able to listen and to hear God. Yeah. And unless God separates us from those individuals, not to say that anything is inherently wrong with them, mm-hmm. but be, unless God separates us from those individuals, we sometimes will not hear his voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And remember, when we, we talked about this the last time, everybody knew that there was something divine about this storm right. mm-hmm. that, was, that was causing all the problems. Yeah. Yeah. Jonah was sleeping. Yeah. Jonah was the prophet that knew God. Mm-hmm. If anybody should have known that this storm came from God and given everybody direction about what to do, it should have been Jonah. Mm-hmm. But it's the captain of the ship that realizes that if this storm is so bad, it must be God sending it. Somebody somewhere did something wrong to cause this storm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's the pagan that influences the man of God to call upon his God and to find out why all this is happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in a sense, in that particular instance, the friends who knew very little were a better influence right. of godly, uh, for godly principles than mm-hmm. Jonah was. Wow, yeah. But unless there are times when, you know, at this point, Jonah didn't, hear God's voice speaking to him. Mm-hmm. He didn't see God in the storm the way everybody else did. Right. And so God had to it. remove him yeah. from that situation and get him alone. And sometimes you might be in a situation where God has called you out from among your friends or among your family and God may have you in an isolated place. Maybe mm-hmm. like your wilderness experience yeah. where God is is put, pulling you aside, not to destroy you, no. not to depress you, but to but to get through to you. To get your attention. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yep. That's right get you into that dark spot where you have nothing else to do but think and listen now you have to listen to that voice that's right that's yeah. right and uh, so we see here that Jonah was somebody that was really um, in the situation where God mm-hmm. is calling him to help his enemies oh, and in a sense we got a comment okay yep. hold on a second Yes. All right, you are on the air. Hello, I didn't know if anyone was here. I was trying to raise my hand. Sorry about that, guys. The point may have moved forward. I was saying that the, if you study the Ninevites, they worship the fish god as well. Hmm. So with the Jonah being cast over and got swallowed by the big fish, that's a way of God using Jonah in a more potent way to reach the Ninevites because when he was spewed out of the fish's mouth, they recognized that they needed to give attention to what Jonah was saying to repent, because mm-hmm. the kingdom of repent or go on a fast, and they were he was able to get their attention more. So, so God is able to use something that we have failed going the wrong way, and God is able to mend everything and put it back together, so His perfect will can be done into what you were saying before, uh, brothers. It's my comment. Amen. Thank well, you. Amen. Thank amen. You. Yeah, God. God can turn the situation around, and God can use uh, you know something and it reminds us of Jesus you know even with the parables Jesus used images he used things that were familiar to the people in order to reach them Um, even when we think about how uh, Matthias was chosen as an apostle uh, after Judas had killed himself and committed suicide 
in Acts chapter 1, remember they chose, chose Matthias mm -hmm. uh, to replace him. And what did they use? What was the means that was used? Uh, they casted lots. They were yeah. casting yeah. lots. Yeah, they were casting lots. And so God can use different means, you know, to reach people. And, and he speaks to us in a language we understand. Obviously, uh, the, the, the language we're reading the Bible in, that, that's not the, the language of heaven. If God spoke to us in his own tongue, we wouldn't be able to understand it. So God speaks to us. He simplifies things. And he, he has ways of reaching us, uh, kind of like how Paul had to speak to the Athenians in Acts chapter uh, 17. In Acts chapter 17, he spoke about the altar to the unknown God. He spoke about your, your own poets have said this. So Paul was using familiar language that the Athenians used. He didn't just say uh, Matthew chapter such and such says this and we read in Isaiah that. The Athenians wouldn't have understood that. So it, just as the caller pointed out, God can use different means to reach people that they understand. Because God is a communicator. God is a master communicator. Jonah didn't want to communicate. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to communicate the message. Yeah. He didn't want to uh, reveal that. Yeah, because he didn't really want them to repent when you think about it. He yeah. didn't want God to really forgive them. He right. just wanted them to be destroyed. That's right. I think if we read a little bit of chapter 2 here, I think that uh, we kind of learn exactly what Jonah, what Jonah learned mm -hmm. while he's inside the belly of, of the fish. Uh, because you know, well, hold off on that. I'm going to get oh, to okay. that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get to that. We we are going to read chapter two, um, and John was about to steal my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> but it is ironic. So God was calling Jonah to be an ambassador, an ambassador, and you know the Bible says ultimately we have to be ambassadors for Christ. Second Corinthians, chapter five and verse twenty tells us very clearly we have to be ambassadors for Christ. Are you running away from, you know, if, you're, if you surrendered your life to Christ, you're going to be an ambassador for Christ. It's impossible to say, well, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I was born again. I love Jesus. And if you really mean it, but I'm not an ambassador for Christ. It's impossible. Now, God may use you. I mean, if you're following God's will for your life, you're going to be a witness to those around you, mm -hmm. whether you know it or not. Just even the way you live your life. Maybe you witness with words. Sometimes you witness without words. But if you're truly following God's calling for your life, you're going to be an ambassador for Christ. But now we're going to, we're going to continue. And we're going, now, we're, now let's read, uh, now let's read uh, chapter 2. Okay. And see. So, Up to what verse? Um, well, if we can, let, let's try and read the whole chapter. It's not very okay. long. And said, okay, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of, the fish, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of uh, Sheol cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All the billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward, my, toward thy holy temple. The waters compass me about, even to the, to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the, bottom of the mount, to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her, with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto, unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Wow. So, I mean, there's so much in this moment in Jonah's life. So he, he comes to the point. Now, what, what were you going to say before? You were going to bring I was going to point out that, uh, you know, Jonah learns a, a few things uh, while he's in the fish's belly. I mean, some of the key verses that, that stick out to me, of course, in the beginning, he's describing his suffering and his sorrow. He realizes that his life is done for, but yet he speaks before it even happens as if he's freed from the fish's belly. Mm -hmm. So it shows us that he understood while he was going through this, that God was not going to bring about his demise, but because God is so merciful, he was able to foresee in the midst of his lowest circumstances, uh, God's deliverance. Mm -hmm. So 
while he's in while he's at the very bottom of, of the of the sea below the mountains and all, all all that's described here he says i will look again toward thy holy temple mm -hmm. right how does he know that from the bottom of the of the of the ocean he mm -hmm. he even acknowledges that his prayer has reached god in the holy temple mm -hmm. before he's even gotten out of this situation yeah. right so right. he looks forward by faith knowing that god will hear his prayer no matter where he is so while he's in the depths of the ocean far away from the temple as far as mileage is concerned uh, and physical proximity while he's so far away mm -hmm. and unable to see i mean it was dark in there it was it was you know he's got seaweeds wrapped around his head the water's coming in he could drown uh he's got all these problems he's he's, he's drowned uh in the midst of, of, of his of his circumstances and his problems but yet by faith he knows that nothing not even those horrible things that were happening to him can separate his prayer from God's ears. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I mean, we can't really imagine, the, uh, you know, being in that in the, the freezing cold ocean and the seaweed all you know wrapped around yeah. you and getting swallowed by the fish, and you know, and inside of that fish's belly. Now, I have to give some credit to this uh, pastor Chelson Lee, who g gave a wonderful sermon last night about the pig pen, about mm -hmm. the pig pen. Um, based on the, the account of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. And when we look at that, that parable in Luke uh, 15, and starting in verse 11, uh, Luke 15, verse 11, when we look at that parable of the prodigal son, it was in the pig pen, mm -hmm. right? When, when, the, when, 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 the, uh, the, when this son was in that, in that pig pen, and he was thinking about eating the, the food that the pigs were eating. Mm -hmm. It was at that point that the, the, the Bible tells us he came to himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he was in that, that pit, in, in that smelly place, mm -hmm. in that stinking place, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where right. Jonah was. I mean, do you think it smelled, yeah. what, do you, what did it smell like? In the stomach. In the stomach of a whale. Couldn't, mm. been, couldn't, couldn't imagine. <laughs> couldn't even imagine it. Um, so he had come to this this stinking place, but it is here at this point of filth. You know, uh, Martin Luther spoke about that place of filth, mm -hmm. the reformer, Martin Luther. And he, he spoke about the necessity of a person needing to come to that place of filth in order to have that repentance. You You really need to see how... I don't. I don't like to put it this way, but I don't know how else to put it. You, mm -hmm. I don't like to say it, but you you need to you need to smell how much you stink mm -hmm. in order to realize mm -hmm. your yeah. your need for for Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the stench of the whale's stomach, that, or the, or the fish's stomach that that Jonah was in, he had really come. I mean, if that wasn't the if that wasn't the rock bottom. If that wasn't the bottom of the barrel, if that wasn't the pit, if that you know they say that these are the pits, right? When you're yeah. real miserable, they say, ah, you know. Comment just came in. Yeah. Uh, should we? Should one wait for God to show them a way in which they can help their enemies, or should they try to help their enemies before God shows them a way? Okay. Say let let's see, let me read that. Say sure. it one more time. Uh, should one wait for God to show them a way in which they can help their enemies, or? Should they try to help their enemies before God shows them a way? Oh, I mean, obviously you got to wait on the Lord. I mean, the Bible is very clear. You got to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And um, we don't want to play God. You can't do anything without God. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. God will keep those at peace whose mind is stayed upon him. So do you think you're going to come up with something better than God or that you know better than God? and you want to jump the gun in order to solve a problem or deal with a situation, God, God cares about your enemies. God loves your enemies more than you do. He loves you more than you love yourself. And so we, we really don't want to do, you know, we, we ultimately, the Bible is saying we always have to be close to God. You don't want to take any actions without God because that's when we get in, ourselves in trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, two other uh, comments and one thing I need to address here. Um, uh, in case you're on my phone and you want to participate, just hit five star, uh, five, and then the star button on, the, on Skype's or on the regular telephone's uh, telephone keypad, and then we'll uh, get the signal here that you're ready to participate. So again, just hit five star on the telephone keypad, and then we'll get the signal here that you want to make a comment or ask a question. Uh, there was also another comment that came in uh, in regard asking about was it a fish? So again, uh, just to make it clear, 
Uh, we're not told in scripture what kind of fish it is. It could be a whale. We know of three instances in recent history in which a whale swallowed a person and then spit them out. Uh, it could have been another type of fish. We don't know. Right. Uh, and then the third comment that just came in, in regards to friends, how do we gauge when we should share truth or to lay off it if, if, they, are, if they aren't from the same belief? If they seem uninterested, should we stop? Should we continue to press the issue? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that Jonah probably assumed that in going to Nineveh that his message probably wouldn't have been well received. Mm -hmm. So do you, sh do you stop sharing the truth just because somebody doesn't want to hear it? Or... Uh, let's say if you have the truth, but you know that the person lives a horrible life, do you withhold the truth because you want them to suffer their just reward? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, think I heard one person say to me, um, I, don't want, I don't want to share the truth with certain people because once they know the truth, if they reject it, they're going to go to hell. So I better not share it so they don't <laughs> That's know. A whole and so, <laughs> I mean, some people say that. But I think the, that the answer is, if you're a Christian, you're going to be living the truth. You might not right. share the truth with words. Mm -hmm. It may be your, your caring, and, you know, your, your, your relationship. It may be that sometimes people speak emotionally, and they reason emotionally. And maybe the answer you have to give them is an emotional answer, or an answer that can connect with their heart rather than their head. So mm -hmm. they're different situations. Yeah, I, I would agree, and, and you know, you, you have to have you have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit to know when and, and the right timing to share something. Because sometimes you can have the truth and you can share it with somebody, but the way that you put it across is wrong, and it can ruin the whole scenario. Yeah. Other times you can have the truth and not share it when you should have shared it. So you really have to rely on God to know and to understand uh, the, the timing in which you share something. Right. Right. Yeah. So going back to Jonah, so Jonah comes to this place of of filth. He comes to this, pla this place of stench, this cold, dark, foul place. And it is in that place. And I think we could think of that dark place as the place without God. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when we decide to run away from God and then we get to a point where we experience the ugliness mm -hmm. of a life without God. That's really the place that there is the possibility for true, re true repentance. Because now, when we look at this prayer of Jonah, jo what is Jonah doing in this prayer? He is really seeing things for what they are. Mm -hmm. He's crying out to the Lord, and then he speaks in verse 3 uh, about being in the deep. He speaks about being in the heart of the seas, being in the heart of the seas. The floods surround me. He has a clear understanding of where he is. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he's assessing his situation. He's looking at things honestly now. He's not playing any games anymore. And sometimes we have to get to that point where we, get, we just have to be honest yeah. with where we are and what things are like without God. And a lot of times we run away from that too. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we run away. I'm having a great time partying yeah. and drinking every night. You know, bouncing around from this person to that person. I'm having, you're not having a great time, but you're running away from the reality. Well, you have to get to a point where you're honest. Yes. And so Jonah comes to that place. He sees things for what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, the waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. <laughs> you know, he probably, you know, seaweed all over him mm -hmm. and... And then he's inside of the fish. And, you know, then he's thinking, what have I done to myself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think another thing about this place of darkness, this place without God that he's experiencing at this moment, yeah. also shows us that God is bringing about a spirit of humility within Jonah. Mm -hmm. right, Jonah right. seems to have thought that he's better than the Ninevites. Mm -hmm. And here we see a clear instance in which he has to sin by running away from God. Yeah, He, he does this to himself. He sins, and yet God is still willing to forgive him, and he knows it while he's deep in the belly of his fish. Yeah. Yeah. And so he says here in, uh, I think it's verse 6, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. Mm -hmm. So before God has even brought him out of the, out of the fish's uh, belly, yeah. he knows that God has delivered him from corruption right. in advance because he knows the kind of God that he serves. Mm -hmm. So it kind of shows us that when we are in the worst of our circumstances, we can look forward by faith and know that God will deliver us from corruption even before it takes place. And so, but when, before God does that, Jonah's brought to a place of humility where he has to realize that, you know, the same people he was condemning, he's guilty too. Yeah. Yeah. And so scripture in Romans tells us, 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And if everybody's sinned and God marks iniquities and just decides to off everybody who's ever done the wrong thing, then we're all doomed. Yeah. Right, right. But yet, Jonah comes to the realization, as he says in, uh, in verse 9, salvation is of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was the key lesson that, that the fish was designed to teach Jonah. That salvation is of the Lord. It's not up to man and how we judge things right. and how bad we think things are and whether we think it's forgivable or not forgivable. Salvation belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And God can save whomever he chooses mm -hmm. because he sees whatever it is that he sees in, in individuals and he, and he chooses to redeem them. Right. And so God brings a lot of souls up from corruption. He's brought us from corruption. Mm -hmm. I mean, we may not have been physically dead, but we were in spiritually dead circumstances. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, you know, enjoying the nightlife and partying and doing my thing. But yet God you, brought you me. You did that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't always a good boy, Pastor. But, uh, you know, but God brought me from corruption. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of, uh, of different circumstances um, that we're all in. And God brings us from the corruption of those circumstances to serve him with newness of life. Mm -hmm. right. And so when Jonah was in the fish, he realized that just like God was about to save him, he wanted to offer the same opportunity for redemption right. to the Ninevites, whom he originally thought didn't, didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. But now instead of looking at the Ninevites as somehow less as good as he was, Jonah kind of drops the self-righteous attitude and he says, you know what? Salvation belongs to God. Right. And, and you know, another thing is in that ugly place, in that ugly place, because Jonah experienced a change, mm -hmm. because Jonah experienced the grace of God, that ugly place in one sense became a beautiful place. Right. Uh, one thing, Jonah was, was safe. He yeah. could have drowned. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that was where he experienced the, the, the transformation. Mm -hmm. And so you may be at an ugly place in your life. Maybe you've come to a point where you're looking at your own life and you're saying, you know, uh, this, is, this is bad. Uh, you're in circumstances. You may feel you're trapped. You may feel like you're in dark circumstances. You may feel there's no way out. But we can take a cue from Jonah. You may, it, maybe it's even in your workplace. You know, how did I get this job? How did I end up here? Mm -hmm. I remember I used to work in a, a, the commercial art field, and there was a guy that worked with us there. He made such trouble for himself in that it was a very, very small niche in the, the, the field of packaging design. It had to do with uh, doing water base uh, printing and um, what they would call a press type and things like that. Probably none of you even, even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and it was a very small niche. And there were several places in New York City that did it. And I had a friend who made some enemies. And, and he finally, he, 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 ended up, he ended up finding a place of employment where they did that. And I ended up working there too because I needed a job. So I, I, I worked with him one place and I ended up working with him in another place. And he said to me, in case you haven't noticed, Mikey, that's what he called me. In, place, in case you haven't noticed, Mikey, this is the bottom of the barrel. So you might be in a, in a place, <laughs> in a you know, maybe your job and you, you might feel I'm at the bottom. I, I can't get any lower. Hmm. Whatever it is, it may be your marriage. Maybe you feel I'm trapped in my marriage. In my ma it just seems so dismal. I feel like I'm trapped. And take your cue from Jonah. What did he do when he was in that circumstance? He mm -hmm. called out to God. And God, God transformed Jonah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, God may not necessarily call you to get out. I mean, God is not going to call you to break your marriage. He's not going to call you to yeah. violate. But God may shed some light and transform you right. in that place of darkness. And you may be free. Mm -hmm. Whereas you are not because your perspective has changed. Right. You might have felt originally I'm trapped, but now I know I'm free. So comment yeah. that's uh, coming in. I just wanted to add to your point that sometimes yeah. the place where we think we don't want to be yeah. is the place where God needs us to be in order to get through yeah. to us. And before you get to that, mm -hmm. sometimes God may take you out of that place. Mm -hmm. But other times God may transform your understanding of that place. And um, so let's look at this comment and then uh, we're going to have to, we're gonna have to uh, close. You are on the air. Hello? You're on the air. Yeah, um, there's a scripture that I think coincides perfectly to what you guys are saying. In, in, in um, Micah chapter 7, it said, um, Therefore I will look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God shall hear me. 
Rejoice not against me, O my enemies, when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be light unto me. And also, when you reach for the prophecy and ministry of healing, Ellen White said that trials and afflictions are God ordains method of overcoming sin and his means of appointed means of success. So oftentimes the trials that comes my way personally from the personal experience is not necessarily that God is doing it to me. Sometimes I do it to myself by being defiant, rebellious, self willed, presumptuous. But even in that a quantum amazing grace, devotional amazing grace, that even these mistakes God is using and in his mercy and his, his divine providence is using to bring about something that is great. So even the experience that we go through of trials and affliction, it's as God's appointed means of me method of success. And it's amazing how God works because even though it's not his ideal plan, yet he can work it out for his perfect glorification as well. Amen. 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 And you know, the, the, the trials of life remind us, uh, like the, there's a song that says, this is not our home. Mm -hmm. This is not our home. Uh, you, we can't be too comfortable no. here. Um, you know, this is not our home. And so we, we can learn from these very powerful lessons that um, when you're in your place of darkness, that's your opportunity, like the prodigal son in that pig pen, to come to yourself, mm -hmm. to realize your need for Christ, and to call out to him. And he will always hear you because God is a seeking God. God is a seeking God, and he's there with you, just like he heard Jonah, and he spoke to the fish, and then that fish spewed out Jonah onto dry land, and Jonah was transformed after that. Mm -hmm. Two uh, comments just came in. Uh, given the scenario, our friends respects uh, our friend respects our beliefs and tries not to put us into any compromising situations, but still denounces what we as Christians believe in. I know we should always pray for them, but do we cut them off at at some point? Do we continue to share with them? Uh, then another comment came in that said, "I think God may just pull out pull us out of the situation just like He did with Jonah." Yeah. Um, so you want to think that you want me to take it? Yeah, you can take okay. it. Okay, so um, basically what, what I would say in regard to that is that we have to be careful when it comes to cutting off friends because sometimes th there's a line, I think, where, where there's, there's the cutoff line and then there's, the, there's the, the person's just testing you and really just doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. Because if you take every insult that a friend throws at you because they're not a believer in God and you just say, oh, the second you say something negative about my faith, I'm going to cut you off, you're also cutting off opportunities to witness to that person. Sometimes Satan works through people that you know to try to discourage you, but also because he doesn't want you to reach that person. Right. Right. And sometimes the negative things that people say and the skepticism that they display verbally is really just their way of asking questions to try to understand the transformation in you. And, no, and in most cases, they're not going to just come out and say, oh, you're right, let me become a Christian too. Right. Especially not initially. But... You never know how something that you say or something that you do might somehow impact that person when they go home and they're sitting on the bed and they're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful with choosing to cut off friends or choosing not to. Right, right. So I, I think that there is a line where, you know, if the person's just a complete negative influence, uh, the person's not at all interested in God uh, in any way, shape, or form, not willing to learn, and is doing things to make you compromise. Right. So, in other words, if that person's influence will cause you to compromise, then that might not be the friendship that you want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. However, um, or sometimes they cut you off. Yeah, that, that, that I think will happen. Yeah. yeah, generally speaking, not in all cases, but generally speaking, I would prefer to have my friends cut me off right. before I cut off one of them. Um, but there are cases where I understand where a person might have to cut off a friendship because of the direction that it's headed in. But in general, I would prefer that they cut me off mm -hmm. because as long as that friendship exists. I have the opportunity to influence that person for good. Take right now, for example. We're on a show. We're talking about, uh, you know, hiding from God. And, you know, our program is all over Facebook. At any given second, somebody that I know can be watching the program right now. Right. Right? And I don't know what influence that I might be having right now over that individual. Mm -hmm. And I may never know because the person may never tell me, hey, I watched your program. Yeah. Right? But if I just cut off my friendships, I can't have that influence. So the thing is... If God wanted us to just not have any dealings with people who are or who are non-believers, then he would just he would have just taken us out of the world. But rather he keeps us in the world because we're the salt of the earth. 
In other words, we're supposed to have influence over the world, not separate ourselves from it. Mm -hmm. So we're supposed to be in the world, but just not of, of the, world. the world. Right. And I think that, you know, and in my experience, too, I've lost friends. I didn't want to lose. I didn't want to lose the, the friends, but eventually they ended up cutting me off. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't fit in with their life anymore. I didn't want to lose them. I wanted to remain friends. We had different beliefs. I could have, you know, remained friends with them, even though we had different beliefs, uh, if they weren't pulling me in the wrong direction or anything like that. And, and, and for the most part, they weren't. But uh, they decided, I guess, you know, um, this isn't the best thing, you know, uh, or the, the relationship fell apart. And that, that, that happens sometimes. And, uh, but the, as far as our story of Jonah, in terms of Jonah's uh, belly of the whale experience, if you're having a belly of the whale experience, if you have come to that pig pen in your life, that is an opportunity to call out to God. That is an opportunity to praise him the way Jonah did. In these positive words, even in the midst of that darkness, open your heart to God. He's there. He, he sees you. He loves you. He'll transform you. He'll change you. He'll do what is necessary. If you're in a situation and God wants to pull you out of that situation, God will pull you out of that situation. If you're in a situation, God doesn't want to pull you out of that situation, but God wants to change your internal perspective and therefore transform that situation, God can do that as well. But reach out to God. Don't hide from him. He is ever present. Let us close with a prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the participation we've had today from callers who were very interested uh, in the topic, Lord God. And we're asking questions and giving comments. We thank you, Lord God, for transforming us through difficult situations for for always being with us even when we hide from you even when we make plans in our lives that were not your plans for us and then we get involved in certain situations or relationships that were really not your your plan uh, for us and then we end up in that place of darkness we end up in that in that pit like Jonah did we know that even there, Lord God, that is the opportunity. That is the, the prime opportunity for us to be broken in spirit or to be poor in spirit. And Lord, we understand from your word that that means to become humble, to become humble and to open our hearts for your spirit and to open our minds for your work to be done in our lives and to be transformed and to stop running away and to stop complaining and just to allow you to work in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, for being able to reach us in our darkest moments. And Lord, we just want to say a special prayer for anyone who's listening into the show who may be going through something, Lord God, that they learn, Lord God, to receive your blessings and that they learn to open their heart to you and to know that you are real, that you are alive and that you can transform them and you can work out any situation that they are in. We thank you, Lord, for being ever present with us and for continuing with us daily. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 But God bless you all and I hope you're able to join us next time on Ever Present. And uh, just a uh quick word uh if you're watching this video and you like what uh what you heard and uh, you want to support our ministry please uh like the video and also subscribe to us on youtube uh so that you can get all of our updated programs and our future episodes uh we would greatly appreciate it so again if you if you were blessed by uh what was said here today and by our ministry please like and subscribe all right god bless you god bless <laughs>